Okay, hello and welcome to the April 19th CDBG office hours. Today we have a special focused office hour session that is going to be section three training. And presenting today will be Ann Schmidt from ICF. Um, I hope this is helpful to all of you. And I think Ann will make some announcements, but just so you know, this is being recorded and will be made available um, by a recording and the materials will be sent out later this week. And I'll let you uh, take over and um, go ahead and present. Thank you so much. All right. For being here. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Felicity. As Felicity said, my name is Ann Schmid. I'm with ICF, a firm that HCD procured to assist with technical assistance and staff augmentation for the CDBG CV funds. And I'm here today to talk about section three, background and compliance. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, there were questions and answers from our last office hours held on April 5th. Instead of doing a recap today, those questions and answers will be sent out in the newsletter that's typically sent on Fridays following office hours. Today's slide deck will also be included with the office hours newsletter. And then that means that the next time we meet on May 3rd, we will just have a live Q&A with no prior recap. One very exciting announcement, if you are a grantee of CDBG CV funds, is that yesterday HUD published a federal register notice that removed the 80% expenditure deadline for CDBG CV funds. Uh, HCD anticipates being able to amend certain contracts to extend the expenditure deadline. Uh, and is creating a process for that. Uh, HCD is working closely with their HUD field office and we'll have more information shortly. The link here is to the actual published Federal Register notice that removes that requirement from CDBG CV funds. And I believe Felicity will be including that link in the chat. All right, so diving straight into section three, um, you know, it's a timely topic. I think a lot of folks are working on compliance and trying to get caught up on the new rule that HUD published. I had a colleague recently do a section three training in 30 minutes. It was a bit of a whirlwind. This is a lot of information to cover, and I do want to allow some opportunity for questions and answers. So just bear with me as we go through all of the content. Um, I think in my own personal opinion, uh, Section 3 is a really powerful and meaningful component of the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968. Uh, as part of that component of the act, it encourages or requires economic opportunities generated by HUD-assisted projects to really provide those opportunities to low and very low income persons. So at the root of section three of the act, it's really the intent to make opportunities available to the folks that HUD programs are specifically designed to serve. So previously HUD had a rule to um, enforce this component of the act by tracking new hires. So new jobs, anytime CDBG or HUD funded programs uh, resulted in new hiring, they would report that and track that. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that reporting process. And as you probably know, that most of the time, CDBG projects were not necessarily creating new job positions, but you know, allowing existing businesses to work in those fields. So HUD was having a hard time showing that they were actually doing this effort of economic opportunity in the programs and places that they served. So they revised the, the way that HUD reports success for Section 3 by coming out with a new rule in 2020 that counts labor hours. And it counts labor hours for both the total project as well as what they call Section 3 workers and targeted Section 3 workers that we'll talk about today. I think in concept, this will certainly result in more data and information for HUD to use to analyze compliance with Section 3. My personal opinion is that the new rule works really well for public housing facilities and locations where the folks being served are integrally tied to the projects being uh, implemented. It, is also probably a bit easier for entitlements who run uh, urban areas who run more recurring programs. 
as a when I was a state grantee um, running a program similar to HCD's program, we responded to the draft new rule sort of expressing the concerns that states have. Not that we don't want to encourage economic opportunities for those within project location areas. I think the intent of the rule of the section is certainly valuable. It's the implementation that's a real challenge. So as I worked on this presentation today, I just want you all to know um, that I'm happy to answer questions and I know that it is a really challenging rule to comply with um, in order to meet HUD's requirements for reporting. So we've provided in here a link to um, the documents that we'll be talking about today. So when does section three apply? So based on the new rule that went into effect in November of 2020, section three applicability for the reporting of hours applies to housing rehabilitation projects, housing construction projects, or other public construction projects. So things in the CDBG world that we would know as public facilities or improvements. Generally, it is triggered when a project receives $200,000 of HUD funds or more, and it's defined in the rule by project. So project is not synonymous with award of CDBG funding. Project is specifically defined as the um, project location or improvements that are under common ownership, management, and financing. So you would typically think of a project as one single site or one construction contract for services in a location that is under single ownership management and financing. For example, if you were rehabbing a um, community center, that would be a project. If you were rehabbing several homeowner houses, each of those homes is owned independently, managed, financed, and maintained independently. Therefore, the threshold would only be triggered if that one individual house exceeded the 200,000. It does not apply to materials only contracts or contracts that do not require any labor. Section three also applies when a project receives less than 200,000, but receives public assistance from housing financial assistance. So this one is really only triggered when you've got other um, HUD financial assistance, maybe voucher programs or some other form of assistance. And then HUD did create a separate threshold in the new rule for their healthy homes program. So this is a program that generally jurisdictions or entitlements apply directly to HUD to operate a lead abatement healthy homes program that HUD funds. And in those cases, because the individual housing cost can be expensive for lead abatement, they've said that it's an individual project threshold of $100,000. But this is just information about the rule for the purposes of CDBG and CDBG CV. We're talking about the $200,000 threshold for projects. It's important to understand that section three applies to the entire project. So similar to labor standards, Davis-Bacon, once you hit the threshold that it applies, it does. it's not limited to the federal funds, it applies to the entire project. And projects funded by one or more combination of HUD programs, if you were to combine CDBG and home, you know, you would look, need to look at the totality of HUD funds to determine if the threshold has been met. So we're going to do a quick little knowledge check. And I know that you all um, you know, can't respond or can only respond through the chat. So I'll talk through these kind of quickly. But just to, to check, so if we have, in the first example, a $300,000 food bank program, is that subject to Section 3? So here we're going to answer false. It is not subject to Section 3 because Section 3 applies to construction projects. Our second scenario, a project is rehabilitating apartments receiving $200,000 of HUD funds. Is this subject, it is subject to Section 3. And that's going to be true because it is meeting that $200,000 threshold. Number three, an activity with two $150,000 construction projects on sites with different owners is subject to section three. That's gonna be false because of the separation of ownership and not and no single site hitting the $200,000 threshold. 
And then lastly, section three applies to a $350,000 construction materials purchase. Now, these are rare. These are not examples that I would uh, use in CDBG often, but section three does not apply to materials only contracts. So we've established the threshold for when section three applies. It applies to- I'm, I'm sorry, Anne, I, I, I went to, I didn't unmute myself soon enough. Um, related to the previous slide, uh, I have a question here from Brenda Bray. I'm asking, are concrete companies or ready mix companies excluded from section three requirements? Not to my knowledge. I'm not aware of any exclusion for section three. It is simply the financial investment of federal funds that triggers the threshold. All right, so what does that mean, right? Once we've hit a federal threshold where we know that section three is applicable, we have um, $200,000 or more of HUD investment in a single project, now what? Well, now the requirement is that we must track our labor hours and we need to categorize our labor hours into groups. So we need to determine who working on our project is a section three worker. So in the new rule, HUD defined a section three worker as one who must meet at least one of the following criteria within a five year look back window. So probably the most prevalent will be a low or very low income resident. So this is based on HUD income limits applicable to the worker's home address based on an income of one. So unlike household income verification, where we would look at all the members of the household, Section 3 is just looking at that individual worker and what their income is or was to qualify as a Section 3 worker. Additionally, you can be employed by a Section 3 business concern. We'll talk a little bit about that coming up or you can be a youth build participant. This is a pre-apprenticeship program administered by the Department of Labor. So a section three business concern is one that meets at least one of the qualifications listed in the regulations where at least 51% is owned and controlled by a low or very low income person, or more than 75% of the labor hours performed for the business over the previous three months were, provide, were performed by Section 3 workers, or at least 51% owned and controlled by a current resident of a public housing or Section 8 assisted household. And then Youth Build is a community-based pre-apprenticeship program administered by the U.S. Department of Labor that provides job training and educational opportunities for at-risk youth ages 16 to 24 who have previously dropped out of high school. The characteristics qualify as both a Section 3 worker and a targeted Section 3 worker, which we'll talk about next. These characteristics qualify a person as both Section 3 and targeted. So targeted was specifically defined to be sort of a subset of Section 3, and it's primarily considered to be geographically based, but it also includes being an employee of a Section 3 business concern or a youth build participant. So in the new rule, HUD defined a targeted Section 3 worker as someone who lives within a one mile radius of the project site or within the allowed project service area if one mile does not include 5,000 people. So you have to think about your project location that has triggered the threshold to meet Section 3 compliance, and you need to know how great the population surrounding that area is. If you have a population of over 5,000 people, then you draw a circle one mile around your project site and any workers whose primary residence is within that mile are counted any section three workers whose primary residence is with, located within one mile are counted as targeted section three workers. Uh, the geographic does not apply to Section 3 business concern employees or youth built participants. They are automatically targeted Section 3 workers. And then this slide is included here because the rule does outline the difference between community development projects and public housing financial assistance projects, so projects that are occurring within a um, Section 8 facility, um, 
I'm not going to belabor this, but the only real addition here is that they target uh, residents of the applicable public aid, excuse me, the applicable public housing facility. So here's a couple more, check your understanding. We're going to say true, false for these comments. A person whose income was 60% AMI last year, but is now 85% AMI can be a section three worker. So when we talk about low and very low income, we're using that 80% AMI threshold. I apologize if I didn't say that earlier. The same threshold that we would use for LMI households, we're just looking at it as a household of one. And so in this scenario, the person is currently over what we would typically consider an LMI percentage. However, it is true that they are a Section 3 worker because we can allow for a look back of a five-year window. So within the past five years, this person was 60% AMI and therefore is a Section 3 worker. In our next scenario, all Section 3 business concern hours count as targeted Section 3 hours. That is true. So no additional qualifier, no geographic qualifier required. All Section 3 business concerns hours count as targeted Section 3 hours. And then all targeted Section 3 workers must live within the service area of the project. And this is false because any employees of a Section 3 business concern or a youth built participant can count as targeted without living in the geographic area. So I think the easiest way to think about how we're collecting and reporting hours is to look at the concentric circles. So we need to know all the workers and all the labor hours worked on a project. And then within that total, there will be workers that are defined as section three. And then within the section three total, there will be workers defined as targeted. So both of these categories are also counted as part of the whole. So you go, um, you don't duplicate the counting, it's all subsets of the whole. So as HUD created this rule, we are now reporting all of our labor hours and we're collecting and knowing who are on our job site is section three and who is a targeted section three and we're analyzing and collecting all of their hours. And so HUD established our a safe harbor benchmark. And so these are the goals for how many labor hours of the total should be performed by section three workers. And of that, how many should be performed by targeted section three workers. So what HUD has established within this rule is that all projects that hit that threshold of being a section three triggered project should strive to have 25% of all labor hours performed by Section 3 workers and 5% of those hours performed by targeted Section 3 workers. So here's another quick check your understanding. In our scenario, we've got a grantee who is running a construction project for which the contractors have reported 2,000 total labor hours 400 Section 3 labor hours, and 300 of those Section 3 are from workers who live within one mile of the project. And for this, we're going to assume that that one mile sufficiently had 5,000 people. So in this first one, the grantee has 35% Section 3 hours and exceeds the 25% benchmark. So in this green box, the person writing this has assumed that 400 plus 300 is 700, over 2,000 gets you to 35%. So that is incorrect because the 300 is a subsection of the 400. So the 400 is really the number that we're using to determine how many Section 3 workers, Section 3 worker hours we have on this project. And that's only 20%. So this grantee has not met the 25% benchmark. In this understanding, the grantee has 15% targeted Section 3 hours and exceeded the 5% benchmark. Now that is correct. So taking the 300 
dividing it by the total, we know that that's 15%, which exceeds the 5%. The grantee has 400 Section 3 hours and has met the Section 3 worker benchmark. So again, looking at the numbers, 400 over 2,000, it's going to be, oh, excuse me, it's going to be incorrect. They did not meet the benchmark. They only hit 20%. They did not meet the 25% benchmark. So what happens if you don't miss the benchmark? So HUD anticipated that grantees running programs and going through this compliance effort may not meet the benchmark. And so what HUD did is HUD allowed for grantees who anticipate that their project will not meet the safe harbor to comply with section three by engaging in other activities. They have called these other activities qualitative efforts. Again, going back to my comment about how this rule compliance may be a little bit easier for entitlements who are running more localized projects or programs. Many of these efforts are things like conducting job fairs or supporting folks getting to work. Um, we, I'll go through the list in a little bit that has more information about these. We've taken for the, for the sample form we're providing, we've taken exactly what HCD will be asked to report to HUD through IDIS on what these qualitative efforts are. When we advocated for um, rule change back many years ago, uh, many of the states said, look, we know we might not meet these benchmarks, but we're willing to do qualitative efforts in a similar way that we sort of track and report on affirmatively furthering fair housing efforts. Uh, there was effort made to sort of say, hey, can we um, skip the labor hours tracking and just do this qualitative effort? And HUD came back and said distinctly no. So the effort here is you must do both if you don't meet the hours. And so what I would encourage all grantees to do is to be really aware of and study the qualitative efforts so that as you're tracking your labor hours, you're not scrambling to do qualitative efforts at the end of your project, but instead you're doing them along the way, which has a double benefit. By doing some of these job fair and um, economic outreach opportunities as qualitative efforts, you may actually bring more Section 3 and targeted Section 3 workers onto your project so that you're both meeting the benchmarks and completing qualitative efforts. So it's critically important. Before, yes. Before we move on, um, there's a couple of questions here about the applicability, like where, where Section 3 applies. Would you like to hold those for the end or would you like to take a break and address those right now? Um, let's hold those to the end and I'll just okay. go back to that slide. Sounds good. Um, okay. So um, record keeping is critically important as all HUD programs and rules and regulations are. Grantees will need to maintain records for their project to comply with section three, uh, maintain or ensure that their subrecipients or contractors maintain the records to support reporting. This will include um, how you locally are tracking payroll hours recorded, worked on the project, um, verification of Section 3 business concerns, Section 3 uh, worker certifications and targeted Section 3 worker certifications, and then a service area map if your location uh, has a population of less than 5,000 within the one mile radius. So these are just a few key steps on how to work through the process. So the first thing you'll do is need to gather project information, determine if Section 3 has been triggered by the federal investment of, of HUD funds in a construction project. You'll need to identify the population of your area that you're working and determine if you need a service area or if the population is sufficient for the one mile radius. And then you'll need to identify what that 80% area median income is for a household of one to be able to uh, verify your Section 3 workers and your targeted Section 3 workers. As you've gathered all of that information, you'll begin to identify the individuals working on your project site, and you'll want to keep a, a list or a log of the folks working on your project and if they qualify as Section 3 or targeted Section 3 confirm their addresses for that targeted component and map that in your service area if needed. You'll also wanna work through verifying if businesses are section three business concerns and have the paperwork to support that. 
And then as your project is moving on, you're going to be tracking and reporting all labor hours, all section three hours, and all targeted section three hours. You'll want to track your progress throughout your project to make sure if you're on track for benchmarks, and if you're not, you're going to want to be doing those qualitative efforts that we talked about. You'll need to monitor contractors and subcontractors to make sure that their records uh, are sufficient. And then, like I said, consider those qualitative efforts if you if it doesn't appear that you'll be meeting your benchmarks. And then once it close out, you'll be providing to HCD all of your all of your information that you've collected, both your labor hours and your qualitative efforts if needed. This information should also. Oh, I have a, there's a question related to um, determining worker income. The question is, how do we determine worker income going back five years? An employer probably cannot require a worker to provide this information. Yeah, so I'll go through and show the sample forms. It is a bit of a, so this program, unlike sort of household income verification, does allow for self-certification. So the questions are really just a form that workers would um, self-certify to. And so it can, if with in the lack of any other applicable data, it can be based on the employer's certification of the current income. But if a worker voluntarily indicates that in the past five years they were uh, previously at a lower rate, then they can sign that on their certification. Thank you. So this is the template of the form that we've prepared for HCD. It may appear in different um, varieties or formats. This was originally developed for CDBG CV, uh, and I think we'll be rolling out with the closeout packet for the annual program, but really just looking at what's minimally required for HCD to enter into the HUD database IDIS for reporting to HUD, and that is the total labor hours on a project, the total section three hours on the project and the total targeted section three, and then determining the percentage of section three over labor total, targeted over total, and did you meet the benchmarks, yes or no? So for total hours, we encourage all grantees to create and maintain a log or list of employees working on the project to document all hours. Obviously, if Davis-Bacon is also triggered, this may be easier because you're already collecting weekly payrolls and you'll be able to quantify that information. There are circumstances, particularly um, the housing where it's not uh, Section 3 applies when Davis-Bacon may not for housing projects of eight units or less, or things like demolition-only contracts where um, Davis-Bacon is not triggered, but Section 3 is. There are certain situations where Section 3 will be applicable when Davis-Bacon is not, and so therefore having forms and tools and compliance in place will help you along the way. For Section 3 workers, you're going to want to ensure that your own Section 3 employees are claiming individual status. So uh, we haven't really gotten into soft costs or design services costs. It is possible to have those count as Section 3 as well. So um, you can use the certifications both for your contracted services as well as folks providing activity delivery services. Uh, and then you're going to monitor and ensure that your contractors are doing the same. You'll need to verify any contracted business concerns to know if they are Section 3 businesses. And HUD, you know, the terminology business concern just means business. It's just a phrase that HUD added to the rule. Um, I think sometimes folks get caught up on that word concern. It's just a Section 3 business concern. It's kind of like a maybe we be being an enterprise. You know, they're just terminologies that HUD um, assigned to it in the new rule process. And there's a clarifying question here um, from Jade Padilla. Is section three only tracking the worker rate or is it still tracking household income? Uh, I think we'll cover that in the form as well. So it's a combination of both, I would say. Thank you. Um, for targeted section three workers, you're gonna wanna identify your service area. You're gonna want to verify that your service area includes a population of 5,000 or more. Um, and then you're gonna to want to plot your workers based on home address within your service area to determine if they are targeted, if unless they qualify as an employee of a business concern or 
a youth build. Um, as I said earlier, don't wait till the end for qualitative efforts. Um, monitor record keeping for all contracts. And so what I'd like to do now, and I think this may be a little bit of back and forth, but I'm going to flip through some of the forms. Um, when we worked with HCD on this process, we were very clear that these were sample forms. We understand that in many cases, contractors are going to have their own um, systems for record keeping, timekeeping, and you'll notice here that we're not providing a sample employee log. There are other Section 3 programs out there, other states who have sample employee logs, but our thought here was that in most cases, contractors can produce a list of the employees working on their projects and their hours. Um, and so what's most important for you all is having the sort of things that are unique to HUD Section 3 compliance uh, to overlay with those resources that contractors will already be producing. So why don't we start with the employer certificate, the Section 3 worker employer certification. And so this goes to Jade's question a little bit. Uh, so the employee is going to identify that they're an individual, that their individual income is at or below AMI of the um, county for which they live or the area for which they live, or they were a youth build participant within a time frame, or they were a resident of public housing within a time frame, or none of the above apply to me. And so most typically, we're going to be looking at Section 3 workers falling under this top one, and they would self-certify based on 80% household of one for the county that they live in. And so what we've done is included in this, as of today, these will get updated um, you know, annually, but right now this form includes the household of one, 80% AMI. So once a worker... Um, goes through this process and identifies if they are Section 3 or not. And again, this can be done by both the employee or the employer. Um, it's pretty flexible on who this is done, but you're just going to want to have the documentation noted. Uh, then their labor hours are tracked. But again, all labor hours are tracked on the project. So Jade, for your question, 100% of the hours of everyone working on the project are tracked. We would just use these forms to identify which people on the projects hours count towards section three um, or targeted section three, depending on their geographic location. I pause on this one. Are there questions about, and again, this is just a sample. You can modify it to your needs. It's just showing exactly what you would need to collect based on section three qualifiers and um, address location proximity to the project site. And a question came in, but I think it's right there. The answer is right there on, on the on the worksheet. Um, what if one mile area, a one mile area has less than 5,000 residents? Yep, so we'll go through a uh, tool that HUD has provided. It is not great and I will show you why, but it is enough to document your process. So obviously, um, the new rule says that if there are not 5,000 people within one mile, you expand your circle out until you've hit a population of 5,000 people. And then we've got a question from uh, Suho Park, who's asking, are the sample forms available to be downloaded or can they be sent out? I can answer that question. Um, we are working on getting the forms uploaded onto HCD's website in the meantime. Um, if you are a grantee, you can reach out to your CDBG CV grant administrator or CDBG rep. We will also attach all of the sample forms that Anne is showing to the newsletter that's going to go out at the end of the week. Thanks. And they will eventually be labeled as appendices to GMM uh, Chapter 5 procurement. Uh, so similarly, as I said, a Section 3 business concern, I think I talked about this in the presentation, what qualifies a business, so 51% or more owned by low or very low income persons, or 75% of the labor performed by Section 3 workers, um, or owned by resident of Section 8 assisted housing. And so you would ask the contractors working on your project if they are a business concern. If they are, 100% of their hours count as Section 3 and targeted Section 3. 
And then the last form that we have is the qualitative efforts form. So again, as I mentioned, I would read through this at the beginning of a project and try to integrate some of these activities as you do your project so that you're not caught non-compliant at the end or having to wait. Um, the rule is new, that's why we're calling it the new rule, but it has been around for a bit now and grantees and states will be um, really under pressure from HUD to make sure that either the benchmarks are met or they can check one of these boxes before they can close activities or contracts. And so the efforts include, um, as I said, things like um, outreach efforts to generate job applicants who are public housing targeted workers, you know, on the job training, apprenticeships, um, outreach efforts to identify uh, and secure bids from Section 3 business concerns, um, hold a job fair, assist residents with finding childcare. So there's lots of options and you would just have to document that you've met these qualitative, I think it's just one, or you do your best to identify qualitative efforts that you have done. And ideally, this will both increase the number of Section 3 workers on your project and check the box for this compliance. So I want to go back to this slide here and open this link. So this is the link for the HUD provided tool to map neighborhood service area definition tool. So this tool allows HUD community development section three recipients to identify targeted section three workers. Now, this was provided um, and obviously, you know, it's written up for to be used for HUD. Uh, I will say one of the HCD uh, reps identified kind of a, a pretty obvious problem with this that I want to walk through with all of you, but you can see uh, the limitations and the reporting capabilities of this tool. So I'm just going to plug in a project address that I think is actually a actual project because it came up. So at 200 Portland Street in Doris, California, we see that here's our census tract. We're right up in very, very, very Northern California on the Oregon border. And here is our town of Doris and our population of our one mile concentric, our one mile circle from our project site is only 1,889 people. So that is not enough to be a service area to determine targeted section three workers. We need to expand this circle until a population of 5,000 is hit. And so if we pull our bar to two miles, that didn't help. And if we expand to three miles, that didn't help. And you can see the reason it's not helping is because our circle is staying within our census tract. Because in rural communities where you have large census tracts, it's actually counting this 1,889 is is not only the population of Doris within this circle, it is the full population of the census tract. And so as I pull this out one more mile, I have now gone a teeny tiny bit into the first census tract in Oregon. But by doing so, I have captured the entire population of this census tract. And so the system is saying, I am good to go. But I think all of us know that that one additional mile expansion did not expand this target area to a population that contains 5,000 people or more. And so I think that my guidance to you all would be is that you can print this just as it is, and it is a compliant document for HUD's purposes of monitoring that you created a target area that met the threshold. But the reality is, is that you really didn't because there are not 5,000 people living in this circle. And so again, this comes back in kind of an annoying way to do your best to determine where your employees are coming from, where the folks working on your project reside through that self-certification form and see if it makes more sense 
to draw a slightly different circle to incorporate them as targeted Section 3 workers based on your knowledge of the local communities. So if this tool works for you and you believe it to be 5,000 and you want to publish it and take those findings, that's great. If it doesn't work for you, I think you have the deference to use local data to say this tool is not actually showing 5,000. And if I have someone who works right here, I'm going to count them as targeted because I know that they are within the circle in which we would not have hit 5,000 real people. Now, the tool does work really well in denser urban populations where you may only want to expand one or two miles to really be serving the folks who work within the service area of your project. And, you know, like all HUD things, service area is a little confusing because we're talking about a construction project, not like a public service that we would normally use service area for. But this tool and this link are here. And like I said, this will help you get to your, you know, compliance checkbox where this turns green and everything is happy. But the reality is there are limitations to the success of this tool. All right, so I think we have I've got a question slide here and then just some basic sort of HCD slides. We can open it up now for questions. Oh, I think your first one was, what is the applicability threshold? So I'm going to have to click all the way back. Well, there, there were a few questions about what qualify, what, you know, what triggers section three. They're tri tri so I, I'll, I'll lump those together. And, um, and, then, and then we have another, I have another set of questions about in so far about what qualitative efforts include. And so and so those are my two groups of questions so far. If folks have other questions, please do put them in the chat and we will get to them. So the first set of questions is a um, piggybacking on Brenda Bray's original question about, um, about concrete and ready mix companies. And the statement, what she says is that they generally consider themselves materials only and not subcontractors. And then Paul Ashby piggybacked on Brenda's question and said um, that concrete and ready mix always say they are materials only. So does this trigger down, trickle down to them as a subcontractor under the prime or not? I would say it does. So in that that caveat of does not apply to materials only contracts. That is in a scenario where materials only is the only thing that HUD CDBG or HUD funds are purchasing. So like the purchase of materials is the only is the only thing that we're doing. It's very rare. Um, it's unlikely that it would meet a national objective or an eligible activity under most of what we fund with CDBG. So if it is a materials only sub to a larger construction project, then all labor hours on that project are applicable. Okay, and then this is a follow up from Brenda on that, which I think she kind of knew that one might be the answer. She says, we have a hard time getting these types of companies to comply. Federal language declares that they are not considered a subcontractor and that they, they are a material supplier only, therefore not required to comply with section three requirements. Is there language that you can point to that states otherwise? Something that I can provide to the concrete and ready mix companies that will help me to ensure compliance. Yeah, I don't have anything I can look and see. You know, I would say like all HUD compliance, this is a do your best kind of thing. And if you, you know, if if you have a sub that completely refuses to provide information, you'll just need to notate that in your file. Um, and Jade offered uh, that she does know that concrete concrete truck drivers triggers prevailing wage. So she would assume that that would include section three time as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not aware of something that would specifically state that. I just know that, and I can look to see if HUD has some other Q&A um, for concrete and ready mix. Thank you, Anne. Okay, so the next um, applicability question comes from Louise Collis. She asks, um, for affordable housing or public facilities, if CDBG is only used for acquisition or offsite infrastructure, does this tag the entire project with section three requirements? That's a really good question. Um, 
I don't know. I think it's going to have to depend on how you're processing the CDBG award. So is so typically acquisition alone is not a standalone activity. And so it would be interesting to know what eligible activity or how you're meeting a national objective is applied to sort of know the universe of the federal project. I'll have to look into that. I don't know. I, I'm i inclined to say that the funding of CDBG in order to proceed with a capital improvement project would make Section 3 applicable to the entire capital improvement project, but. That would be my inclination as well, is that it, 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 it makes a Section 3 applicable and then whether it whether it is triggered or not depends on the size of the individual project that you're talking about. Yeah, and I think there's lots of, I mean, that that question of acquisition alone carries a lot of, you know, weight in terms of the timing and the staging and the sequencing of projects. So if it is for a known project that is planned to proceed, then I believe it would, if it hits the $200,000 threshold. Okay, thank you. And the next question about um, applicability is can, uh, from Lori Adams. Can you expand on when soft costs activities are triggered? Sure. And I realize that we are missing a, a, a slide on this, but um, HUD kind of gave a uh, perk bonus in the new rule on this, where they said that if you have professional services, architects, engineers, administrators, um, who are section three workers that you can add those into your section three worker numbers without adding them to your total, which is, I think there's a reason we didn't cover this because it gets really confusing. So they're basically saying that soft costs, professional services that just happen to be section three business concerns or section three workers can be added to the section three and targeted section three buckets without increasing the total labor hours, which by design would give those hours more weight in helping you meet your benchmarks. And I can provide some, some quotes from that uh, if folks come across that. I think we, you know, we wanted to get through the bare minimum of section three, which is labor hours and targeted and section three workers. Um, if you have scenarios where you have professional services, architects, engineers, grant administrators who qualify as a household of one, 80% um, AMI within the service area, um, you know, we can provide that information on how to track those hours. Thank you, Anne. So we've got a handful of questions about um, qualitative efforts. So the first question is from Christine Viterelli. She asks, are you recommending that a contractor host a job fair at the start of a project to capture low-income resident workers in the project area? So the responsibility of qualitative efforts would be on the grantee, the subrecipient of CDBG funds, the entity who is managing the contract with the contractor. Now, you'll see that many of them are sort of coordinated. And this is where my comment comes back to, this is a little bit more designed for public housing authorities or entitlements where, you know, they may be um, more engaged or involved in things like job fairs. Uh, so I think that the answer to this would be, yes, you could do a jointly sponsored job fair between your procured contractor and the community in which the project is taking place or whomever is receiving the CDBG funds uh, if jobs are needed for that project. Now, what's interesting about these qualitative efforts is that they're designed to be applicable to the project at hand under HUD funding. But as we all know, when we procure firms to do work, they have the workers or they wouldn't respond to the procurement. And so it becomes a little bit of a catch 22 of like, when is the right time or place to do this? And so if you have a contractor who, you know, bid the work, got the work, and then had a whole bunch of people leave, you could say, hey, we'll jointly do a job fair with you to help you regain your employees so that we can both be have a qualitative effort and 
better meet our benchmark. But they're not all about job fairs. You know, you as a community can do lots of things to help folks within your community find economic opportunities. It doesn't have to be limited or tied specifically to the thing you are funding. You just have to prove that you've done it. So the, there's a couple of follow-up questions on that. Um, Louis, I think you more or less spoke to this, but Louise asks, does the grantee have to conduct the qualitative efforts or can another entity such as a local nonprofit conduct the efforts? I think as long as you can document that they were conducted for the purposes of grantee compliance, that that's fine. You have to have some kind of arm's length relationship. And then I'll go to Jeff Doran's question, which is what backup documentation is required to be submitted for the qualitative efforts, specifically the various outreach efforts? Your best effort. So if you hold a job fair, have a flyer about it, if you, um, you know, assist folks with finding daycare, keep a log, uh, there is no uh, specific required documentation. I would say do your best. Um, this is a new rule. HUD has not yet monitored for it. Perhaps like all compliance, we will find out what HUD wants to see as they monitor. And am I right, Anne, that there is no, there is no um, location to submit the backup documentation at this time? It, you need to retain it in your project file. That's correct. All that you will submit to HCD is which one of these boxes you checked so that HCD can turn around and check that exact same box in the HUD database. So we we would not be, we're not going to request this information with financial reports, but HCD might request it from you when we monitor. And if HUD monitors us, then we would be requesting that information from you at that time. Yep. And right now it's designed to be submitted with closeout documentation. Um, and then Jade Padilla asks, will there be a qualitative checklist for contractors that we could provide them to assist with their best efforts, either during bidding or during construction? Um, I think you can just use this one if there are efforts that align better with the contractor, or you can take, the, if you feel like there are efforts listed in here that are better suited for the contractor, you can just shrink it, you know, remove any ones that you think are not applicable. Um, you know, that's the reason we're providing them as samples. You can modify it as you see fit. And then Jade also says, um, some of these efforts don't seem, I think you already kind of talked about this, but some of the efforts don't seem specific to the project itself. Mm -hmm. Would it be sufficient that our agency also oversees one-stop centers that already provide these services? I think if you can make that case, if you're, if you're already providing these and you can show that they occurred sort of concurrent with or in alignment with the HUD funded project that triggered section three, then that's fine. I equate them very much to the state's obligation to pass down affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is a really similar process where you may not be doing it specifically connected with the CDBG funded activity, but your community is doing it or you're taking efforts annually. And so you're documenting that process. Thank you. And then we just had a comment going back to the question about concrete uh, mixers and ready concrete and ready mix suppliers. Um, just a statement that concrete suppliers, their drivers are subject to prevailing wages. Oh, and, and another, another uh, comment here from Brenda Bray about ready mix drivers and concrete companies. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, she says ready mix drivers and concrete companies trigger state prevailing wages, but not federal Davis Bacon. Is this is where it gets tricky to ensure Section Three compliance? What would be the definition to material suppliers only? So I think Anne, that was one you were going to have to circle back with anything you can find. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll look back. I mean, I think that the the safe harbor would be to count all labor hours for folks working on the project. Thank you. And again, like I, oh, I was just going to say, like I said, Section 3 will be, it will apply in times that federal Davis-Bacon does not apply. And so you just have to be prepared to work through, um, you know, did we hit this $200,000 threshold? Is it for construction? I mean, basically everything here, housing, rehab, housing, construction, and other public construction projects is pretty much the umbrella of all construction eligible activities under CDBG. So are you funding construction? Is it 200,000 at one project site under the same ownership, maintenance, and management? 
And if so, then you need to collect and track the section three hours, all labor hours and targeted. Thank you. And maybe part of, I mean, part of this is that if section three allows you to count um, professional services, then it's not the same. It, that That's maybe part of the case of it's not the same as what is as prevailing wage. It's a different, it's a different grouping of subcontractors or in, uh, entities that you're engaging. So yeah, I'll tell you, HUD, HUD says that they streamlined it to better align with cross-cutting regulations that grantees are already working through. And I think they threw just enough curveballs in this to not really streamline it. But again, personal opinion, not the opinion of HCD or ICF. <laughs> So two more, actually, I'll go ahead to Louise's question, which is related to this. And then we've got one more question from Christine, and then I think we're gonna be at time. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Louise says, uh, <laughs> Davis-Bacon is a Department of Labor program, but I think section three is HUD. Does this mean we cannot rely on Davis-Bacon definitions for section three? Uh, I guess I don't know what you mean by definitions. Uh, they have different thresholds and different, triggers for section three workers and targeted so you can you can use the davis bacon the department of labor weekly payrolls to track your hours or collect data on your hours but they are two very different compliance regulations thank you and then um i'll just move back to christine's question and then i think we'll wrap up uh Christine asks, our city has a homeless navigation center which offers supported services and helps place homeless uh, people in homes, provides assistance with obtaining documentation, get jobs and services. Would this, would this effort qualify? If you can find a way to check one of the boxes on the qualitative efforts uh, list, then I think it probably would. Thank you. And then Lori just has a final comment. Gotta love how HUD implements streamlining. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree, Lori. <laughs> well, I hope this was helpful. I know it's a complete whirlwind of information. Having the slides um, as something you can reference back to, and particularly that link for checking your service area should be helpful. And we'll send out the sample forms. Again, these are samples. Um, we're asking for what is minimally required for HCD to report to HUD. You are welcome to modify the form or tweak it to best serve your needs as long as you still are able to report that same information to HCD. Thank you so much, Anne. And as, as always, if you have further questions, you can bring them to our office hours in two weeks or bring them to your grant administrator or your rep and we'll make sure that we get you some support. Thank you for joining everyone. And thank you, Anne, for your great presentation. Thanks.